I am pickier with in-person events. And so attendees have to sit through all these different ads and videos and, and, you know, just to get to some content. People will go for the, the easy win. When you're building a community, you have to keep in mind, are you giving them something inside your community that they can't get anywhere else? We really need to rethink what event success looks like from a marketing standpoint. Don't ask any question if you're not going to do anything with the responses. Hi, Diana. Welcome to BIMS Event Talks. I'm happy to see you. Hi, Nadja. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm very happy you found the time to join me. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to hear about your experience in the event industry. Could you please give a short description what you're doing now and uh, in general, how did you come to the industry? Yeah, absolutely. So I started in the industry in about 2007, so about 15 years in events, but I've been oh. in hospitality since uh, 2000. So uh, events, hospitality, hotel, restaurant, I've been kind of touching at least one part of the industry um, for over 20 years now. Um, mm -hmm. I started in events in the association world. Uh, I was a meeting coordinator fresh out of college and uh, took a few years off for family. And then I came back on a part-time role, um, kind of on the other side of events, dealing with uh, working at an event venue, working for a florist and event designer. So definitely got to see a lot of the supplier side of events um, in those roles. And then when I came back full time, I was on the corporate side. So I was an event manager uh, from 2015 until most recently in 2021, when I stepped out to go independent as a consultant and speaker in the industry. So now I provide consulting, speaking services, and I'm also a podcast host of the Experience Junkies podcast. Do you work in uh, the certain company uh, now or just uh, as a freelancer? Um, yeah, so I'm independent. Um, I've done some contract freelance work for some event agencies, some direct for in clients, um, and then also just consulting for those that maybe don't have an in-house event uh, presence, don't have a team internally mm -hmm. that can do event work, and I can provide some strategies and tips for your uh, team. And uh, also you are the author of uh, Memory Maker Methodology. Yeah, so this is something relatively new. Um, mm -hmm. I would say I've been through a lot of learnings, not just about the event industry and, and you know, the work that we do, but just outside of it and life in general. Um, I experienced a couple um, uh, deaths in my family last year. Uh, one was my grandmother. So she was 90 years old. It was expected. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a long uh, process. Um, but then, you know, in the fall, my cousin, who's in his mid-40s, he was not sick. It was very sudden and unexpected. And those two kind of really reframed my thought, thoughts about life in general and kind of how can we make the most of the time that we have here. And at the end of the day, when, you know, you do leave this earth, the only thing that you leave behind, obviously you might leave behind some, you know, your estate, but you leave behind the memories with mm -hmm. the people that love you and, um, you know, your friends, your family, you know, your associates and your extended network. And how can we be better about curating memorable moments? How can we be better about um, remembering those moments that matter um, and, and taking that with us, you know, throughout life? So that's kind of my greater mission, like not just in terms of events, but just, you know, you know, when you're pouring yourself a cup of coffee and really taking a moment to appreciate life and appreciate that moment. Um, but then how do you take that uh, methodology or mind frame, mindset and apply it to events? So the method maker methodology is really about the, the science behind uh, making memorable events. And it's focusing on what you want the audience to feel, what you want them to know, and what you want them to do. So creating those moments that will impact one of those buckets. Um, so, for example, um, think of some, some scientific things behind memory creation, uh, like the idea of sensory stacking. 
So sensory stacking is where um, you might have something that evoke that's um, got a smell. You're um, touching into people's visuals cues. You're touching with their um, sense of touch or their sense of taste. If you can set stack two to three senses in one uh, experience at once, it's going to have a greater impact and it's going to be even more memorable to the people who are consuming it because more of their um, human senses were evoked at once. Um, another concept is the idea of Abraham Hicks. He uh, talked about this 17 second rule. And if you um, think on a memory, on a concept, on a vision, if you think on something for at least 17 seconds, it will change your perspective, change your emotion, change mm -hmm. like a mental shift for you. And so how could we include that kind of concept in an event? Could we have the MC, you know, walk the audience through an exercise where they are thinking about um, a memory, you know, in their past, if we want to touch into some nostalgia, or maybe he's giving them prompts on uh, an imaginatory kind of exercise. And after that 17 seconds, we're able to evoke the emotions that we want to see in our audience. So that's what the memory maker methodology is about. Just It's just really about the science behind how humans make memories and how we can apply that mm -hmm. concept to our events. Yeah, it's, I, I really love the uh, scientific side of this mm -hmm. uh, approach. It's exactly. really cool. Yeah. And uh, uh, as, uh, as I understand, uh, many people uh, already use your methodology in their events. Uh, no. Say it's it's a relatively new methodology, um, but I have done some consulting just kind of uh -huh. with just general event strategies. But this is a new concept that I'm still kind of researching and developing for sure. Um, but it's just really about human centric design, and I know Beans mm -hmm. that's part of you know your company's uh, yeah. uh, um, mission and vision with events. But just making it more about how are we creating impactful moments that really. It's not necessarily so much about the bells and whistles of the platform or so much about the event content, but just how are we impacting lives with mm -hmm. this experience mm -hmm. that we're creating? How can we measure the effect of uh, this methodology? You just, you are like uh, give a surveys to the participants or something like that. Well, I mean, all event organizers, we have to do our surveys as part of doing our job. But how can you really understand the impact something's left on someone emotionally after an event? Mm -hmm. And I think it really comes down to shareability. What does it look like um, in terms of after your attendee leaves your experience? Do they have to run to social media and share lots of pictures and a recap of their experience? Are they um, emailing their friends or telling their family about what they saw when they came to your event. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that shareability factor is what's important. Because if you think about it outside of the terms of events, if you think about when people go on vacation, um, when they go to a new restaurant in town, when they do something fun with their family, what's the first thing they do? They share it with others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it impacted them. They had a good time. It's memorable. And so I outside of, you know, your normal everyday event survey metrics. Which events do you like more, physical or virtual? It's such a, it's such a <laughs> hard question to answer. What I would say is I, I am pickier with in-person events in terms uh -huh. of in-person events require more of a time and monetary and money uh, invest, investment. And so, and they require me to sacrifice time with my family. Like it's just, it requires a lot to go to an in-person event. So my standards are a lot higher. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to really involve what's the location. If it's a location I've been to before, then that kind of no knocks it down some. What is the content? Is the content amazing? Or mm -hmm. is the content average that I've seen that knocks it down some? Who are the people that are attending? That's usually my number one thing. Um, 
I, I'm still determining if I'm going to go to WEC this year just because I've got some personal obligations that may interfere with me attending. But in my mind, I'm thinking if I miss it, I'm going to miss seeing so many people that are in my network that I either met last year or I've met online that I know will be there. And so those are the kind of like the three things that I really determine if I want to attend an event is the people that will be there. What is the content and what's the location? If, you know, all three of those are kind of, eh, then I won't even bother <laughs> wasting time thinking about it. What I would say on the flip side with virtual events, um, it's, my threshold for uh, participating is much lower because mm -hmm. a virtual event may only be a half day online or it may only be a couple of hours. So it's much less barrier of entry for a virtual event. I think what's harder is not necessarily getting me to register virtual for a virtual event, it's getting me to attend and getting me to stay. So I think with a physical event, once I've registered and I'm there, I'm not going to leave because I've made such an investment. And with a virtual event, especially free ones, the investment is much lower. So, you know, what's going to motivate me to log in on the day of? What's going to motivate me to stay logged in? Um, so I think to me, I really love a virtual event that not only gets me to register, gets me to in log in, but also gets me to stay the whole time. To me, those are the events, that's the hardest thing to do, I think more so than an in-person event. Um, and so I think when events do that successfully, get their audience engaged and get their audience to um, consume as much of the content that's, that's prepared as possible, those to me are like, that's like a big gold star. <laughs> You know, if you put uh, so much efforts into physical event, probably it will be more memorable because you. Yeah, to me, it's not about physical or, or in person. I think mm -hmm. it's really about um, the uh, organizing team and kind of the structure that they have. So, for example, does the organizing team, do the planners have creative freedom? Do they have um, a comfortable budget? I mean, that's always, we're always asking for more, more money to do our experiences. Mm -hmm. But um, outside of just the monetary, are strategies kind of dictated to them from leadership? Um, you know, is it very much, you know, we need to generate leads from this event and that's our sole determination for success, not necessarily, you know, how many people logged on, how many people stayed on, how many conversations were had, what are people talking about post-event, what are the things that people are using to determine event success. I think those that structure, if you will, or the planning environment really dictates the ability to create a memorable moment. So if the organizing team has some creative freedom, if they're able to create attendee-centric strategies um, that are about you know really creating a great experience, then that's going to just kind of naturally evolve. But if it's really more so about just getting butts in seats and you know getting people to register, and it's about like giving sponsors um, credence, a lot of um, events because you know um, they may be free for attendees but sponsors mm -hmm. kind of subsidize it then the organizers cater to the sponsors and so attendees have to sit through all these different ads and videos and and you know just to get to some content and so i think if it's attendee centric if the organizing team has some creative freedom um and if they're coming from it from a standpoint of how can we you know make this a memorable moment, what do we want them to know, feel, and do, then that really kind of determines the ability to be successful, whether it's in-person or virtual. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now we have tons of content, tons of events, uh, both in-person and virtual. And how is it possible to stay unforgettable in such a uh such area uh when we have uh, so much content around us and uh where where can we take ideas from yeah that's an excellent question because i think today's society in general it's an attention uh it's just, it's an attention economy you know um, mm -hmm. You've got social media, you've got email, you've got your calendar alerts, you've got, you know, just going outside and, and you know, seeing billboards everywhere. It's all about how do we get people's attention in this, you know, overwhelming <laughs> volume of stuff that is in their face every day. Um, and I think 
when I think about the volume of content I see, just for example, like on LinkedIn, what you'll see is people will go for the the easy win. They'll go mm-hmm. for what are what is everyone else succeeding with? And I'm going to, to copy that. So especially with like LinkedIn influencers, you'll see that there's kind of a trend with the the format of their content and how how they write it. For example, like the one line broken up with, with space. Once some influencers started doing that, you started seeing a lot of people following and just kind of, okay, I'm going to model my content after them because it's going to get more eyes on it. It should not necessarily be about the volume of eyes, but it should be are you getting the right eyes? And if you're trying to get the right eyes, your content should speak to that to that audience. And I know we talk about this at events all the time that, you know, it has to be centered on the audience and what do they need, but it also needs to be a little bit forward thinking, right? Um, I would say in the event industry, if you look at all the content that's being built right now, a lot of it is about virtual events, event trends. Um, it's a lot of rinse and repeat. So I really don't think it's that difficult for events to stand out if you just actually try to go break away from the crowd and not create the same content that everyone else is creating. To me, that's the strategy right there that you're going to stick out because it's different. Um, and, And so I think that's really key is just, you know, breaking outside of the noise. And, you know, if you look at a box of crayons and they're all yellow and you see one red crayon, that one automatically is going to draw your eye. So I think it's the same thing with your event content. Are you giving this, are you giving the same thing that your audience is going to see anywhere else? Sorry. Um, I, I recently saw, um, uh, Christina, uh, I think it's Garnett. She's with HubSpot and she, um, organizes mm-hmm. their, community program. And she made a comment that's really set just kind of strongly with me is when you're building a community, you have to keep in mind, are you giving them something inside your community that they can't get anywhere else? And I think we have to apply that to our events. Are we providing um, speakers, content? Are we providing experiences that they can't get anywhere else? And if that's the case, then then absolutely it's going to be more memorable because they can't get this anywhere else and it's going to be unique carved out for them. I hope we do here. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Um, And I want to ask, uh, since uh, I'm a marketing manager and uh, I consider events uh, as a marketing channel um, and... um, I need to understand uh, different marketing metrics uh, and uh, uh, like ROI or engagement rate. Uh, and I want to understand how the event can influence on the uh, goals of my business. Uh, so how do you think uh, this methodology and memory making in general, how can it influence uh, on the business metrics? That's a great question, Nadja. And I follow um, a lot of people from a company called Refine Labs and their CEO is Chris Walker. So I highly recommend any marketers to um, look them up because their leader is really in the demand generation space. Mm-hmm. And they're really big on separating out things that really should be sales focused from marketing strategies. So for example, kind of you're talking about metrics and um, and kind of determining the success. So a lot of times marketers are held to the standard of how many MQLs or marketing qualified leads are you bringing to the table? And is that really the work of marketing or is that really sales? Is that really more outbound? Um, and so I, I would just recommend people follow them. They've got a podcast. They present a lot of content on LinkedIn and other um, social platforms. But um, I also heard him recently on a webinar for marketers. And I kind of asked a question kind of to your, to your standpoint of, you know, if we are uh, event organizers or event marketers and our role is, you know, to support sales, um, how do we gauge the success of these in-person or virtual experiences. And he, he, again, kind of pushed back on the metric side of it. He said, from a traditional standpoint, most events are not going to meet that metric. You know, you really mm-hmm. need to think through what are the metrics that matter to, 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 uh, to judge an event. Because in reality, 
most of mm-hmm. your prospects, um, if they're coming to an event of yours, they've probably been touched by email. They've been touched by mm-hmm. social. They've been touched by so many other points that you can't really give that event all the credit for them raising their hand um, for a demo or something of that nature, because really it's just part of um, their experience being in the funnel, if you will. And so if you try to just look at events from that standpoint, they're really going to fail because you can never give them sole attribution for Mm -hmm. lead generation. It just is impossible. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was really interesting, the the point that he made and thinking more outside the outside, more to the to the lens of how does this affect the brand how does it affect recognition um how does it affect their loyalty like when you're doing in-person or virtual experiences we have to really rethink what we want the end goal to be outside of just Mm -hmm. mqls and and roi and and bringing you know like giving a list to our sales team that they can call after the event like we really need to rethink what event success looks like from a marketing standpoint um, so it's not really a straightforward answer that I'm sure you were looking for, but I, like I said, that's why I would highly recommend people to follow them because he gives a lot of strategies for how you can go to your stakeholders and kind of push back on some of these things so that as marketers, you can be really more in the marketing lane and separate out some things that really might be more for the sales team. Um, and, and yeah, they provide tons of content in that regard. So I highly recommend following them. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, while we are trying to create uh, unforgettable moments in the events, uh, which mistakes uh, usually do the organizers? What they're doing wrong? Um, I love event professionals. I am an event professional. This is you know the industry that I've chosen to stay in, and um, but we can get really mired down in tactics. We can get really mired down in logistics. And sometimes we're so focused on the minutia that we lose sight of the bigger picture. We lose Mm -hmm. sight of our strategy. We lose sight of, again, the emotions that we want to evoke um, because we're so focused on the how and, you know, getting things from point A to point B. So I think it's really key for um, event organizers to always have the North Star in front of you when you're creating your event strategy. And I think that you have to start from there. So again, like I said, with the memory maker maker methodology, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? And as you're going through, I mean, event, event planning is a lot of logistics. That's kind of the core of it. As you're going through that process, keep the North Star in front of you. So if you need to have a sticky note on your computer, so when you're having meetings with vendors and you're having these conversations about how to um, transport people to an offsite activity and what should we include on the bus, keep in mind, what do you want them to feel, know, and do? Um, and I think if you can make sure that you thread the big picture strategy through all these little minutiae detailed decisions you have to make, it'll make sure that it all is cohesive for the attendee when they're experiencing it. Because all through the process, you've kept that at the forefront of what you want them to know, what you want them to feel, what you want them to do. Um, And so it should hopefully make sure that that experience is like a story that you've created for them with a start a, mi- a begin, a middle, and an end, um, and so it's it's really kind of everything kind of supports it each other in that experience that they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, one more question. Uh, apart from the uh, this topic, I think I learned uh, uh, a post at your LinkedIn about uh, the post event service uh, mm-hmm. that you. Uh, a bit, um, a bit uh, irresponsible. Uh, <laughs> analyze, uh, analyze yeah. uh, participants' uh, impressions in the mm-hmm. past, uh, and now you have uh, a different opinion. So, could you please tell uh, how to do it in the right way? Well, I event surveys that that is a battle that I am always willing to fight. Um, I think there is a tendency to take the survey from last year, change the date, change the speaker name and publish it. And I am a big believer 
when it comes to event surveys or attendee surveys, don't ask any question if you're not going to do anything with the responses. <sighs> if you're not going to respond to their um, request for content, if you're not going to respond to the fact that they don't want to hear from the CEO with a product update at the beginning, if you're not going to take in the responses of the attendees, don't ask those questions. I just think it's not fair to our audience to give these mm -hmm. long surveys. And <clears throat> excuse me, as an organizer or stakeholder, we may give a two minute cursory glance through. I think that's just not fair to your audience. So I am very particular about having as few questions as needed, like focus on the meat and the things that we really, really, really want to know from the audience. And those are the only questions you should ask. And then on the flip side, when we get that feedback and we get that information, um, you know, I've looked at tons of surveys over the past 15 years. And, you know, as an event professional, I'll tell you that you have to focus on the trends because you will always have outliers. You'll have people who loved everything. It was perfect. No comments. Love the team. And you'll have people, everything was terrible. This was the worst event I've ever went to before. <laughs> you know, are. But where are the trends? Where are the commonalities? Where do you see consistent comments? Like you see consistent comments about something, then those are the things like that's a, a flag you need to pay attention. Um, so once you throw out those outliers of random things that don't correlate with anyone else and you focus on the meat of what they're saying, you've got to adapt to it. You've got to listen to it. Um, take into account what your attendees are saying. Um, but then also look at the future of your industry. Look at kind of forward thinking. Uh, I remember seeing something on LinkedIn recently and talking about the best marketers are the ones that know where your audience is headed, not just where mm -hmm. they are right now. Because sometimes as customers, we don't even know what we want because we don't even know what's available. So yeah. as a marketer, it's your <laughs> role to kind of tell me where things are headed. And then I'm like, oh, you know, if you think about technology and where things have headed, a lot of these things haven't necessarily been, um, you know, consumers have been craving them. You know, did consumers crave smartphones? I mean, probably not. But now that we have them and they're coming out with all these new innovations, we appreciate each new iteration. And so I think as event organizers, we have to do the same thing. We have to look a little forward and not just where things are today. And I don't necessarily, when I say that, I don't mean you've got to jump into NFTs and you've got to jump into the metaverse. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is more like audience behavior and um, you know experience behavior and looking at trends with travel, looking at those types of things and how can we apply that to our events and kind of knowing where people are heading. So I think it's just a combination of looking at the feedback, only asking the questions that really matter and that you're going to listen to, um, but then also taking that knowledge with, okay, where the industry is going, where our audience is going and what they need that they don't even know they need, how can we apply um, that, that feedback? So that's, that's what I think is really important when it comes to event surveys. Mm -hmm. Very cool, thank you. And uh, please yeah. uh, give her one advice to the event organizers in 2022. Oh, um, <laughs> I think event organizers, God love us. We have a tendency to be people pleasers and um, also for the sake of protecting the event and making sure that it goes off really well. Um, we will cover for those who uh, are not necessarily event organizers, but they are part of the event. So let's say it's a speaker and they don't get their content to us on time or they don't do the tech check, or let's say we've got an internal um, creative team and they don't get assets to us on time. As event organizers, in order to make the event go off well, we cover for people a lot. And I mm -hmm. think sometimes to our detriment, so I think as event organizers, my one tip or, you know, suggestion is for us to be better about boundary setting and uh, protectors of our mental health and protectors um, of, you know, our, our uh, experience creating these things. You know, we love what we do, but it doesn't come, it comes with a, its own set of stress. And so I think if we can be better about, and it's hard, especially for people who are internal, um, if you're an internal event planner, 
it's it's harder for you to give that feedback and push back because the stakeholders are your bosses. <laughs> but I think if you can kind of outline, um, you know, if these you know deadlines and deliverables aren't met, here's how it affects me personally. Here's how it affects the team. Here's how it delays other deadlines, and really make that obvious because I think a lot of times um, our colleagues, our stakeholders, they don't understand all the different pieces of the dominoes that if you hit one, how it affects everything else. And so mm -hmm. I think if we make that picture really clear for people, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to respect it, but at least we've communicated how this is impacting us. And if you are in a toxic environment that does not respect uh, boundaries, that does not respect deadlines, and it's a consistent thing, um, we are in a employee economy right now. There are a ton of jobs out there. Please look. <laughs> um, I just don't stay in a space that is not healthy for you. Um, don't stay in a space where you're not able to do your best work. Um, and even if it's not a full-time role, there's a ton of contract work available right now. It is really uh, freelancer gig economy heavy in events right now. Um, so that would be my advice to anyone who's in a situation where it's not necessarily the best environment. You're not able to um, have your boundaries be respected. Um, and the process of planning events is really painful. Look outside of where you're at because I promise you there's something better for you. So those are my tips is just have some boundaries and, and look for the best work environment as possible because what our work that we do is stressful even under the best circumstances. You know, I see in your advice and also in your methodology uh, something like humanistic approach, and I really love it. Mm -hmm. It's all about yeah. It's all about people. It's cool. Exactly. Yeah, and exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I have one more special question, special for you. Yeah. Um, please give advice to me. Uh, what should I do to make BIM event talks unforgettable? Oh wow, that is um, <laughs> a great question. Um, what I have found uh, over the past couple years of being really active on social media and the event industry is that one relationship begets another. So mm -hmm. uh, what my re recommendation is, as you're meeting event professionals, is ask them to make introduction, introductions to others, um, even if it's just one, because that snowball effect of building a network will kind of mm -hmm. help you kind of understand the conversations that are being had in the industry. It'll help you see, like I said, that the trends in terms of what are the common problems that people are having. Um, and it also helped point to you to the people who um, have the biggest audience or or the um, conversations that everyone is pulling up a seat to join into. So I think as you're meeting with people, just make sure that they are um, giving you introductions to more people in the industry, because once you kind of build that network and as it swells, it's, it really starts to be a ripple effect.